Hello, Star Trek fans, and welcome to the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we're watching Star Trek Deep Space Nine from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we are on Season 6, Episode 8, Resurrection. This episode aired November 17th, 1997. Before we talk about this one, anything to say about last week's episode? which was the wedding episode? No, it was perfect. I thought it was pretty perfect, at least the podcast. (laughs) The episode was really quite good as well. It was very interesting, that's for sure. And I certainly enjoyed the Klingon wedding. You were very impressed by that. Yeah, I liked the mythology, I guess, that they put together for the ceremony. I thought that was very good. Oh, agreed. I enjoyed it. It wasn't so grim as we've had... (laughs) A bit of grim so far this season, so it was a nice relief. Yes, it was such a nice change. Everything has been so heavy. Yeah, and it was a change, and it wasn't, you know, Rumpelstiltskin. It was a pretty good episode. (laughs) Oh, gosh, yeah. Should we get started? Yeah, and this week I'm the peanut gallery, so I'm ready to go. We open on the station with happy, upbeat music. Dax has invited Kira to dinner, and we see Dax once again trying to set Kira up with a date. All of Dax's suggestions seem pretty bad, and it makes me wonder whether Dax has paid any attention to Kira in this whole time of what she looks for in a partner. I think we've been talking about this same guy, Captain Baudet, right? Since season one. Yeah. Has she not met any other people? I assume Dax owes him money or something. (laughs) Maybe. Is this the right place for me to start ranting, or do you want me to wait? Just let me get to the end of these scenes. Okay. Well, we go to Ops, and Miles gets a warning beeping on his console that somebody is attempting to beam into Ops. They can't tell where from, and they beam in. We should get a hint that something strange is happening, because it's the transport is all kind of sparkly and not the normal style. Mm. And the guy's facing the opposite direction. Always yeah. a sign that there's a big reveal. I also feel that somebody in Ops at least should be shouting force fields up and engage biofilters. Exactly, because we're beaming diseases into Ops again. It's not like it's the first time it's happened. Oh my gosh. Right. Well, this person beams into Ops, and as Kim said, they're facing the wrong way, and they're crouching down, and you can't see who it is, and Kira goes to ask if they're okay, and the person pulls a phaser on her, and we see it's Brile, although a much scruffier version of the one we've seen before. Maybe if you muss up his hair a little bit, he'll be less boring. (laughs) Kira says, it can't be, and we go into the opening credits, and then we start Kim's first rant. (laughs) (sighs) Jadzia and Kira discussing transparent skull Captain Baudet again. This is why women get annoyed at how they're portrayed on television. Women are not always talking about boys when they're alone, especially women who are not in high school, who have jobs and lives. After consuming a lot of popular media, I'm not sure if I believe that. Yeah, yeah. Of course, we have frivolous conversations about movies and television and hobbies. And of course, we discuss relationships. But we also talk about the world, stress, anxiety, issues of the day. If these two are going to have a personal conversation about love right now in this moment in time, they should be discussing that all night conversation that Kira and Odo had in the previous episode. Or maybe how difficult it was to be in the situation that Kira was in under constant threat from Ducat on the station while everybody else was gone. What was it like living with a sexual predator? (laughs) Yeah, because Dax had a little bit of experience with that as well in a previous episode. So they could be discussing how Kira is coping with the remaining trauma from that. But no, instead, we're talking about whether or not Kira wants to go on the date with this guy again. It's just so stupid. Ugh. There's so much they could be talking about. If they wanted to discuss relationships, they should be talking about Odo. Like, what's it been like working around Odo once he declared his everlasting love for her? I mean, there's just... I could come up with 15 different things they could talk about in just the time it took for us to have this stupid conversation. It feels very high school drama. It's terrible. Do better. End of rant. Until they talk about Captain Baudet again. Well, Boreal is now holding Kira hostage and tells Sisko he wants a ship and Sisko lets him leave for a docked runabout. As they're leaving, he grabs a sandwich that's sitting in Ops somewhere, and I thought there was no food in Ops. <laughs> no, Kira had just ordered it. You sure it's not in the manual? Oh, they're not supposed to have food in Ops, but Kira somehow always seems to have a snack. Well, he grabs this snack and stuffs it in his face. I will say this is funny because Sisko doesn't seem too worried as he's letting them leave. 
He's like, okay, off you go. No, he's not worried. Maybe it's because there's literally no hostage situation that couldn't be stopped by Odo. Oh, that's true. I liked Avery here because I got this complete sense of Cisco was almost saying, dude, you picked the wrong hostage. <laughs> yeah, he looks more annoyed, really, than anything else. Like, oh, geez, I don't have time for this today. Kira, can you just deal with this now? As Beryl is taking Kira through the corridors, he mentions the Alliance, and Kira tells him there's no Alliance here, and she realizes he's crossed from the alternative universe. And I kind of like that they called it the alternative universe. No mirror reference, just alternative. I don't know that they call it the mirror on Star Trek. Yeah. I think we call it mirror, and the title of the very first one used the word mirror, but I don't think they say it in the dialogue. Oh, okay. Kira leads him to the runabout pad, and when he tries to get her to open the airlock, She tells him he's not going to kill anyone with that disruptor. The power cell is cracked. And he asks how long she'd known. She replies, since we left Ops. Yeah. I love it where he asks her, then why did you come with me? And she says, oh, I need the exercise. (laughs) Oh, yeah, because (laughs) they climb up a ladder like 57 decks or something. (laughs) Yeah. Well, he tries to strong arm Kira and ends up getting thrown to the floor and knocked unconscious. Yep. Odo then opens and steps out the airlock and says, The resemblance to Vedic Boreal is remarkable. Duh. I think we missed a chance here for Odo to ask, Did you kill or cripple him? <laughs> or why did you wait so long? <laughs> yeah. We now cut to this alternative Boreal sitting in a holding cell and he's asking Kira when he can get to meet himself. She tells him, This Boreal is dead. He asks her not to send him back. Even being in prison or a labor camp is better than going back. And then in Sisko's office, Kira tells him she doesn't want to press charges. Sisko then warns Kira he knows what she's going through. Sometimes he'd look at the other Jennifer and she'd smile or the light would hit her eyes and it would be his Jennifer. You still feel this connection with them. You can't explain it. And she assures him it's not going to be a problem. And then Sisko kind of sternly says... Make sure it doesn't become one. Of course it's going to become a problem. Well, yeah. I liked Cisco here. I I do feel, I think he was stuck on what kind of approach to take. He started off with this very softly approach, saying, look, I know exactly what it's like. He got sucked into this whole thing with the alternative Jennifer, and it became a problem. Yeah. And then he sees that doesn't really work on Kira and then he goes completely hard-nosed and takes the commanding officer approach of saying make sure it's not a problem. I don't even know what approach you could take in that situation with Kira, which way she would better react to or would she even take your advice? Well, I'm really surprised that Cisco or anyone didn't say to her of all of the people in the universe, in the two universes, to appear here, it's your ex-boyfriend. Yeah. We should be very suspicious that this is the person who just randomly appeared. This is clearly not random. And then they should have just kept her apart from him. It's like, you don't want to press charges, that's fine. But you don't need to be going anywhere near him. We're not sure what he's up to. Let's get Odo to be surveilling him. I was just surprised that they said, oh, you better be careful. You know, it might tug at your heartstrings. Yeah, like get him off the station first chance. Get him off the station. Absolutely. We now see Burial walking freely on the promenade and lots of people are looking at him. He's a little surprised at all this attention and Kira tells him about their Burial being a great loved and respected religious leader. Yeah. Kira is on the way to the Bajoran shrine and invites Burial to go with her. Initially, he refuses, but during the ceremony, he comes in and kneels next to her. In the shrine, we see that the Orb of Prophecy and Change is visiting the station. And if you notice, they appear to be playing some of that Bajoran Yanni music in the background. Oh, yeah. She explains the orbs and the prophet to Burial, and Burial tells her that he's never really believed in anything. Then she invites him to dinner at Dax and Wharf's. Don't do it, Kira. No, what a terrible idea. Yes. I did find it suspicious when they're talking there in the temple. He was saying that he was reading about Bajor, but he never looked himself up. So he didn't know that he was a Vedic. I mean, come on. He's so (laughs) clearly hiding something. Yeah, you'd expect someone like Kira to be a little bit more suspicious. But I guess this is sort of the point of... She's not looking past who he physically resembles. Yeah. Which is kind of almost what Cisco did. True. Actually, I think that's exactly what Cisco did. 
Well, Cisco also was falling into a trap of when Jake was starting to become attached to the mirror Jennifer. That's true. Yeah. Well, then we see Beryl at dinner with Dax and Kira, and he's funny and charming, and he's making them laugh, and he tells a story about how he stole a Klingon's mechleth, and Worf basically says, this is impossible, that could never happen. And to prove his point, Beryl steals Worf's mechleth and cuts the dessert with it. Yeah. <laughs> Which I thought was kind of a nice touch. If you could see a Klingon behaving that way, if that could never happen. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it could totally happen. And then Worf's reaction is, well, I guess you're a better thief than I thought you were, which was quite <laughs> funny. In this scene, Worf and Dax appear to be wearing matching purple loungewear. Oh. It's a bold choice for a dinner party with someone you've never met before. <laughs> I mean, sweats with friends is one thing. Well, you know, Dax is kind of cool. Meanwhile, Kira is still in full uniform, but nobody else was. Maybe she came straight from work. I'm thinking she came straight from work. Well, the dinner party is a great success, and they go back to Kira's quarters, and he tells her more stories about his life on Bajor. And then, oh dear, Kira and alternative burial sexy time. Yeah. And she seems so happy in the morning, but happy Kira means in for a fall, Kira. Uh, I know. I will say this Burial seems like more fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he definitely seems to be the lovable rogue Burial. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in ops, Bashir is hanging around, basically wanting to get up to date with the latest gossip. <laughs> and sometimes I think Bashir is still in high school. Uh, totally. If not, the writers are actually in high school. Yeah, well, I think we've proven that many times. Dax asks if Kira is going to see him again, and Kira tells her that she's going to take him for an orb experience, which apparently he actually wanted to do. Mm. We now go to see an orb ceremony where Beryl actually opens the migraine trigger, as Kim calls him, <laughs> yes. and he's covered with a glowing light. And then we cut to the replomat, where Beryl seems strangely distracted. For the first time, he's no longer hungry since he's got there, and... <laughs> this theme through this whole episode is Beryl seems to be eating. Yes, that's true. He asks Kira if she fully understood her first orb experience, and she tells him that no one really understands an orb experience. If they're anything <laughs> like when you interact with the prophets, that's probably an understatement. Well, I think the interactions with the prophets directly seem to make more sense than the orb experiences. Although if nobody understands them, it is funny that we keep doing it. <laughs> yes. She tells him no one fully understands an orb experience. You have to live with it and absorb it. He tells her he saw a vision of the future, but he saw more than that. He couldn't keep track of all the images. And he saw the other burial. He found the whole thing very confusing. Yeah. She tells him that they shouldn't be talking about this as an orb experience isn't meant to be shared. I'm calling to hell with that. Where would all the prophecies come from? If orb experiences weren't meant to be shared. Yeah, that was a little strange. It's almost like, oh, we didn't want to write that. Yeah. So we're just going to say you shouldn't share it. Because there's something super interesting about a mirror person yeah. having an orb experience. Right. Because if he's seeing the other version of Burial, does that even really make sense? Yeah. Are the prophets confused by the mirror verse? Do the prophets know about the existence of that? I mean, we really could have explored something interesting here and we didn't. I, that, yes, I have some over analysis about this, but uh, yeah, there is a question here. Could Kira just be saying this because she finds it uncomfortable, Beryl telling them this? That's possible, but she also could have just said yeah. that. I really don't want to talk about this because my boyfriend is dead. Yeah. But I, I think that's a good question. Yeah, I found this such a odd cop out of, oh, we don't talk about them. Oh, Agreed. I think we've talked about them before. Yeah, I agree with that. Kira's early orb experience, at least on the show, I don't know if she had one before, was when she kept seeing Beryl naked, yeah. remember? And she didn't want to talk about it. But Beryl kept asking her about it. So I definitely question this. We don't talk about it. Yeah, thing. I'm with you there. I did notice at this point, we're halfway through the episode, and I had really hardly written down any notes because not much has happened up till right. this point. And I thought, what is with this episode? Where are we going? And I think you walked into the room at that point. And you're like, oh, yeah, you keep watching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, All right. I'll also make a comment about the acting here. I feel that the actor here is actually being given a character with a little bit more meat. The previous Burial seemed to be very flat. You made the joke about that. Well, it might be more interesting. Mm. And I think this shows that the guy really didn't have a lot to work with. Yeah. 
Maybe because he was a religious figure yeah. and he didn't know exactly how to play that in a way that made him an interesting human. But I mean, well, a Bajoran, but you're still a person, yeah. so you should be able to make that interesting. But yeah, he is given a little bit more leeway here to be loose, to be funny. Right. And I guess that just was an opportunity for him to be better. Right. Because I think here he does a great job of giving this impression that the experience, the orb experience, was disturbing. Yeah. It wasn't a pleasant experience. Well, Kira tells him that it will be all right, and she kisses him and leaves. When Brile gets back to his quarters, he tries to rest, but to Brile's surprise, in comes clubbing Kira from the <laughs> parallel. Ah, uh, yes. Also known as the Intendant, she's wearing her full clubbing outfit, including the tiara. <laughs> of course, it's not an outfit without the tiara. Yep. She said she decided to come early and starts kissing him, and then asks, how's their little plan progressing? He says, it couldn't be better. It's right on schedule. And we go into the dramatic ad break. And if you haven't seen this episode at this point, you'd be shouting, oh, come on. <laughs> I thought it was Miles that was supposed to be tortured. Right. I did laugh in the scene when Mir Kira says something to him like, this has never happened before when he says he's tired. It's like, he's never been tired before? <laughs> How long have you known him? Well, we come back from the ad break and it's clear that these two have been in quite a close relationship. Yeah. He tells clubbing Kira he looked into the orb and she asks, how soon can they get their hands on it? Then she reveals the plan. They are going to steal the orb, take it back to the alternative, and then use it to unite Bajor against the Alliance. With this version of Barile acting as a holy man, yeah. Clubbing Kira is already looking forward to the wealth and power. So she's the alternative universe version of Kai Wynn? Mm, yeah. It's not exactly noble what she's trying to do. <laughs> Finally, she says, we're going to have so much fun. I can hardly wait. <laughs> she does seem to be having fun. Clubbing Kira is such a gem. <laughs> yes. She finally kisses Beryl and tells him, when you see the major, give her that from me. She is so in love with herself. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. Nana Visitor just really makes this character. Yeah. She's just so over the line. It's wonderful. We now go to Quark's and Barile is drinking heavily and he's getting very upset that people keep looking at him. <laughs> yeah. Well, Quark, being a Ferengi, has a business proposition for him. They'll put him in robes and have him pretend to be Vedic Burial, so they'll make money tricking Bajorans. I think that's a bad idea. Yeah, that kind of sounds like Quark, though. Yeah. Burial says he's known people like Quark his whole life. Nasty, greedy little minds willing to do whatever it takes to make money. And Quark responds, that's because we think the same way. Burial replies, well, right now, I don't like either one of us. No. And leaves the bar. They do a great shot here where Burial is standing outside the shrine and we see lots of activity on the promenade, including a couple of Klingons, and they do yeah. this 360 degree rotation around him. It's such a great camera shot. And we really don't see that often on the show. Yeah. From a production standpoint, that must be a nightmare to set up and shoot. <laughs> it really gives a great sense of the station and how busy things are and how much it's, so if you like, come back to life. Since yeah. the occupation. I really enjoyed that shot. Major Kira is now working in a cargo bay and Quark comes in to collect a shipment of brandy. He starts talking to Kira saying that he finds her new boyfriend a little different from previous ones. Yeah. I can't decide if Quark giving any kind of relationship observation is a good idea. No, I wouldn't <laughs> be interested. Eventually, he gets around to the whole point of this conversation with Kira, telling her that He's seen a lot of customers, and Burial is one of the tormented ones. And then how Burial spent a couple of hours hanging about outside the Bajoran shrine. Kira dismisses this, saying, he's probably got a lot to think over. And Quark replies, either that, or he was figuring out a way to rob the place. Mm. Quark leaves, telling Kira that he hopes the two of them are happy together. <laughs> oh, the look on her face, you can see she is just shocked at this. Yeah. My note says, stop being mean to Kira. <laughs> yeah. And is she annoyed because Quark is right or is just she annoyed because it's Quark? 
I took it as she was annoyed Quark was right. Yeah. That Quark was pointing it out. And really, it should have been obvious to her. And it took Quark telling her, which I would see as something of a sting. Yeah. Although it was kind of good that Quark told her. But oh, yeah. Maybe we'd jump into an overanalysis. I can't decide whether it was Quark seeing off another potential rival or whether it was Quark actually being a decent individual and saying, Carrot, this dude is a scumbag. Yeah. You need to get your head on. I think I would give a different answer early on in the show yeah. than I would give now. At this point, Quark has had to depend on the people on the station, at least the ones that he could depend on. So it's yeah. possible that he's doing something that is not selfish at this point. I think in yeah. seasons one, two, or three, that would have been virtually impossible. I would agree. From the events that have happened in this season alone, yeah. it does look like he is maybe looking out for Kira. Maybe. He's still a Ferengi at the end of the day. Yeah. Back in Baral's quarters, clubbing Kira is now wearing the Major's uniform, and she <laughs> describes wearing the Major's clothes as, it feels so intimate. <laughs> She is so in love with Kira. It's hilarious. This is like a whole different level of narcissism. <laughs> yes. It's not just that she's in love with herself. She's in love with this mirror version of her. It's just hilarious. It is pretty funny. Mm -hmm. Beryl has actually stolen two com badges to complete the look. How do you call each other on these two badges? This is the problem with no mm. phone numbers. Maybe there's a code on the back. Where you've got like little dip switches <laughs> you have to set. Uh-huh. Especially since there's two major Kiras. I mean, I don't know. Well, if they do voice commands, at least it seems to, in the future, work. So that when you say, call major Kira, it doesn't say, calling Odo. Mm. But now it would say, which one? Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Call clubbing Kira. <laughs> the plan is now underway and Boreal goes to the shrine and starts breaking in. Meanwhile, clubbing Kira goes to a secured area and runs into a security guard. After briefly sexually harassing him, she knocks him out. Yeah. There's some HR complaints there. Uh, yeah, definitely. She knocks him out and then she drags him <laughs> into the cargo room. Yes. And after she does that, she does this flouncy little walk after. It. It's very funny. Yes. She's really sort of playing up the role. As usual. So in the cargo bay, there's actually a transporter and she has one of those devices that makes them work to beam people into the alternative universe. And she runs it over the surface, which we saw Miles do in an earlier episode. Right. Meanwhile, Beryl has successfully broken into the shrine and has access to the orb, but waiting for him is Kira. And he initially thinks it's clubbing Kira. Yeah. She tells him he had her completely fooled. Yeah. The thief who is in search of redemption, who could resist that? But it didn't fool Quark. She has a phaser on him, but in comes clubbing Kira. <laughs> Did nobody notice two Kiras go into the temple? <laughs> Basically one right after the other. Well, she's very happy to see Kira saying she couldn't leave without saying hello to herself. Oh, my God. <laughs> Kira tells Beryl not to let clubbing Kira have the orb. He may have come here for the orb, but he found something else. Clubbing Kira tells her that he was just using her and everything he told her was a lie. She stands with a big grin, gloating, and in her victory, Beryl sighs and then shoots her, stunning her. <laughs> That was funny. Boreal tells Kira that when clubbing Kira works up, her first reaction will be to kill him. But he's talked his way back into her good graces before. He'll be all right. Yeah. Wow, is that a toxic relationship or what? I think every relationship with this version of Kira is pretty toxic. Yeah. He eventually tells Kira what he saw. A life with her together, a family. But eventually he'd find a way to ruin it. He's a thief and he belongs with clubbing Kira. Mm. Using the transporter device, he and clubbing Kira beam away to the alternative universe as Kira watches. The end. She should have told him, please destroy that thing when you get there and don't come back. Yeah, the last 10 minutes of this episode were very interesting. Oh, yeah. The first 36, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it felt like there was more they could have put in here, but I guess they were kind of building up the Kira Baral relationship thing. Yeah. If the orb of prophecy that he was looking at was one that shows the future, yeah. why did he see the dead Beryl? That just dawned on me. Or maybe he didn't. I think maybe it just showed all the possible paths for Beryl. 
Maybe. of the alternative Beryl himself, and one of the paths was the dead Beryl. I'm not sure that makes any sense, but like Kira said, nobody knows what it means. And <laughs> neither do the prophets, they just make the stuff up. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess we should go into overt analysis. What do you have? Well, first thing, I think there is a fantastic tie in to discovery here. We know the mirror universe is just sort of this oppressive, hopeless existence. Burnham even says, even the light's different here. Right. And I think this story really gives some legs to that discovery story about the mirror universe. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, because of Disco's expansion of the mirror alternative universe, it makes episodes like this better. It gives you a much better feel of this almost grim hopelessness that is part of the alternative. Yeah, that's true. After watching Disco, you can definitely understand when a character wants out of there. Yes. I'm not sure you can understand that as well, just with the episodes from Deep Space Nine. Right. And it's interesting to see a show that is in the future, made after this, that I think actually enhances the watchability of the original Deep Space Nine. Oh, I totally agree with that. There have been some things with the trill in Disco that have made me appreciate Deep Space Nine more. There's lots of things that have happened that I've been like, oh, now I get why that happened. So yeah, I think the two are tying things together really nicely and enhancing each other. I definitely agree with that. I think when you look at the brutality that they show in the Mirrorverse in Discovery, yeah. they're actually more able to show it. They obviously have a bigger budget. They have more ability yeah. to have yeah. effects, you know, and, and they show a lot of that stuff. Here, they just kind of talk about it with the two people in a room and, you know, yeah. you're not able to see it and feel it quite as much. So I, I get your point. Right. Next thing. So I guess the alternative Bajor doesn't have a religion based around the prophets. Yeah. That's one of my questions in my overanalysis notes as well. Do the prophets exist in the alternate? I assume they do. Do the prophets look at Bajor and go, yeah, these guys are jerks. We're not going to talk to them. Yeah, I would like to know that. I don't think it's ever answered. Hmm. And next thing, which is kind of leading on from that, the orbs, do they connect to the prophets directly in some way? In which case, bringing the orb back to the alternative, would it even work? Or are these two clowns not smart enough to really think that far ahead about the big picture? Yeah. They take the orb back, they open it, and nothing happens. <laughs> or it's just all static. It's like an antenna that has nothing to connect to. Oh, or it really does just give you migraines. <laughs> oh my God. I was wondering that same thing. I feel like if the prophets aren't aware or aren't part of the different universes, the multiverse, yeah. then... I got to believe this would be a completely pointless device. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And if it does work, that raises a question of, are the prophets also interdimensional? Yeah. Is talking to the prophets from one Bajor in parallel the same as talking to the prophets from here? Yeah. So many possibilities. Yeah, we definitely don't know the answer. It would be good to hear it, but yeah. certainly the prophets have never mentioned this. But maybe to them, it's all the same. Oh, gosh. If they're aware of it, it's just all one big thing. That would be even freakier. Time means nothing and the parallels mean nothing. It's all just one thing to them. Yeah. Next thing. I kind of like this weird idea in the parallels that people are being drawn together. The same people, like Cisco and Jennifer, clubbing Kira and Beryl, that there is this sort of odd bond that is one influencing the other. Mm. That I thought was really kind of interesting. So even you, though the Beryl and Kira relationship in this universe worked, this alternative universe, there's still a relationship, but it's weirdly broken and toxic. Mm. But it still exists. I suppose it gives a little credence to the idea that some things are just meant to be. Some people are meant to connect. Yeah. Right. I think I sort of like the idea of that. Yeah. And they play on that in different ways in Discovery as well. Yeah. With the connection between Giorgio and Michael, you know, not a romantic yeah. thing. But they also work against it in Discovery. So that's interesting. Right. But they also have more characters. So I guess it's, again, held back a little bit here by the size of the story that they're able to tell and the number yeah. of characters that they have. Right. And the number of episodes dedicated to it. Right. 
Yeah, with the small number of episodes in each season of Discovery, they manage to have more Mirror Universe episodes <laughs> than any yeah. other show. Yeah, I feel these are almost like the teaser episodes for a bigger view of the Mirror Universe. Yeah. And I think my final point is, and this is maybe an observation, I really think you should listen to Cisco, who's been through this with Jennifer. Yeah, I think he should have been more insistent. Yes. But I mean, we saw what it did to him. It's impossible for it not to have a devastating effect on you. Right. Especially when it's that close. Like if it had been somebody who had been gone for 10 years or 20 years, yeah. then it might just be weird. But this is still within the last couple of years and would right. still be quite devastating. So I agree. She should have listened to Cisco. And that, I think, wraps it up. My overanalysis. Okay. I actually have a surprising number of points in my oh, excellent. list of overanalysis, but I don't think any of them are very complicated. But the first one was, do the prophets exist in the other universe? I can't remember if it was clubbing Kira or if it was Mirror Burial. Somebody says something about being the bearer of the orb, as yeah. if that's something. And I wondered, was that something from a text or was that just a phrase that they made up? So yeah. that made me wonder, just like oh. what we were talking about, do the prophets exist there? Is there a religion there? What's the deal? I think they're being very cynical and they're basically going to make the religion. Yeah, I think that's a good guess. Then I was wondering, what actually did make Burial reconsider? Was it what he saw in the orb? Was it an attraction to the Kira that's not evil? Was he starting to feel pangs of guilt? Was the religion starting to interest him? Like, what made him turn around? Okay, I think it was the prophets. Remember what they did to the Grand Nagus. Oh. I have the theory that what they did to Burial was... Maybe they changed him so that he was able to feel empathy or love or whatever was missing from his life and showed him this alternative life and perhaps even made him experience the feelings that Burial had of his religion and his faith and whatever. So you literally ended up changing Burial. So after he came out of the orb experience, it wasn't the same Burial that went in. Interesting. That's the kind of headcanon I need. That, that's, what people, <laughs> that's what people come for, that kind of headcanon, because I hadn't thought about it that way, but that's actually a really good point. I hadn't considered what had happened to the Nagus when he ran into the prophets, but yeah, yeah. something similar could have happened. Hmm. And I don't think the prophets would have any qualms about doing that, of just going, well, we made him better. Oh, What's absolutely. The What's the issue? Yeah, absolutely. I had a couple of surprises in this episode. One, I was surprised that Quark was the one who gave Kira enough info to suspect Burial. I would have expected it to be Odo, honestly. So that was a surprise. Yeah. And then the other thing that surprised me is I was just waiting the whole time for Odo to catch Burial coming out of Kira's quarters or to yeah. catch the two of them kissing or whatever, because that's something that in the early seasons, they would lean into that all the time. Yeah. That sort of silly, childish, soap opera-y kind of thing, but it never happened. Yeah. And I was relieved. So I think those were two things that surprised me, but also two things I appreciated about this episode, that they didn't yeah. fall yeah. into the cliche. They didn't follow the bad sitcom. Exactly. When they easily could have. They easily could have, yes. So then the last point that I have was I find it really impossible to believe that the Bajorans just leave the orb relatively unprotected in the temple on the station considering yeah. <laughs> how valuable it is to the Bajoran people and also all of the crazy people who come and go on that station. I just, I don't think they would just leave it there, even with that little force field around it. It just, it seemed very unrealistic to me. One subspace shun and it's gone. Uh, totally. Something like that. You would expect at least some kind of professional permanent guard. Yeah. And monitoring. Yeah, totally. You could have had a whole thing of Odo complaining about how it's sucking up all his resources because... He's having to monitor it with cameras and guards and everything. You could yeah. have done a whole piece like that. But I guess that would have then turned this episode into a heist episode, which would really not have worked. It's not what it was about, I yeah. guess. Yeah. But yeah, that's a good point. Okay. I'll allow it. <laughs>
So now let's go to women in the future. And of course, at the beginning of the episode, there was that very narrow view of Kira and Dax. It was disappointing. Yeah. And I'm not sure that this version of Mirror Kira, as funny as she is, I'm not sure that she does much for women in any universe. (laughs) 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 But I do really enjoy how much... Mirror Kira just loves her counterpart and just <laughs> drools after her. It's actually quite hilarious, and she plays yeah. it very well. I can't imagine any of the other actors on this show doing it quite that well. Oh, yeah. And having it be as funny, I guess, as it is. So yeah. that yeah. is very amusing. But that is all. But also, she manages to bring out the villainy of this character. Oh, she definitely does, yes. All right, that's all I have for women in the future. So let's go to rating. Thumbs up, thumbs down, or neutral. What is your rating? I think your summary earlier of this episode is pretty good, which is it starts off and you're a bit like, "Eh." and then the payoff, it's like, okay, this is great. I hate to see Kira tortured in this way, but the episode itself, I think, works really well. It's oddly enough an episode that, like I said, it's got better with time. Because of things that have happened later. For me personally, because of the expansion of the mirror universe Mm. in Discovery. And I think it makes the episode and Burial's character work better. Absolute thumbs up. Really enjoyed it. Hmm. I don't really think anything in this episode was particularly great. Yeah. I did enjoy the last, I don't know, 10 or 11 minutes uh, because something finally happened. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I wasn't super interested really up until Mira Kira appeared. I didn't think they did a great job of convincing me that Kira would just immediately get in bed with this Burial and not be even slightly suspicious that of all the people who could appear, it would be this person. So I did not really enjoy it. And I certainly didn't like the way that the episode started. So I can't give it a thumbs up. I'm not sure I'd give it a thumbs down. It's more of a meh. Yeah. For me, I didn't find it particularly moving. There were a few things that we talked about that were interesting, but I can't really give it a thumbs up. So I'm going to go neutral. Okay. May I have a counterpoint to one of your issues there? Sure. I have the feeling that the reason why Kira fell for this guy so quickly is a carefully crafted plan by Burial and clubbing Kira to go after the points that Kira would be most vulnerable about. This was a guy that she'd been in love with and had died tragically. And also, as she said, who doesn't love the story of the, the thief seeking redemption, the person who wants to make good on all the bad things that they've done. And I feel that maybe it was very deliberately targeted at Kira to pull all the right heartstrings to make the plan work. Well, first of all, I think the thief with a heart of gold is a television or a movie trope. I don't think that's a real thing. But I agree that what you're describing could have happened, but I don't think they showed that. Yeah. I don't think they worked hard enough at the episode to convince me of that, you know, that they had really come together with this complicated, devious plan in order to get inside her head and to get into her heart. It was just instead they had one dinner and she (laughs) was ready to accept him. It just, it wasn't earned. I guess this is all my headcanon from that one line where Clubbing Kira says he's lied to you the whole time. Yeah. I filled in an entire backstory there. Yeah, I see. (laughs) I see that. Yeah. (laughs) All right. I think that wraps up. Season 6, Episode 8. Come back next week for Episode 9. In the meantime, if you want to send us your own over-analysis of this or any episode, or if you just want to say something nice, you can email us at rebingeit at gmail.com or tweet us at rebingeit. We're also on Instagram and YouTube at rebingeit. You can check us out on talkthroughmedia.com where you can leave feedback for individual episodes, and you can also listen to the other podcasts in our network. We are part of a Patreon, patreon.com slash Star Trek TTM. The Patreon covers all of the podcasts in the Talk Through Media Network. Thanks for joining us on the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. That's it for me. And that's it for me. 